Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today I'm joined by Dr. Bob Breyer, also known as Mr. Mummy. Dr. Breyer is one of the foremost experts on mummies and Egyptology. He has investigated some of the world's most famous mummies, including Ramesses the Great and King Tutankhamun. And today we're going to ask him all about his new book, Tutankhamun and the Tomb That Changed the World, published by Oxford University Press. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today, Bob. Thanks, Kelly. Glad to be here. Um, let's just get right into it. Do you want to tell us a bit about what your book is all about? Yeah, I did the book with a very specific purpose. Most people know the story of the discovery of Tutankhamun. It's one of these stories that people love to hear again and again and again of the you know, impoverished archaeologist Howard Carter hooks up with a wealthy Lord Carnarvon and they make the discovery of the century. Um, people are familiar with that. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that research has been going on since then, meaning, okay, so it takes 10 years to excavate the tomb. There are so many treasures in it. They're so fragile, they have to be preserved. Um, so after 10 years, everything is sent to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, placed in cases on display, and people think that's where the story ends. But it doesn't. Since, since all those objects have been sent to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, there have been loads of research projects on the objects, and we're finding out things about Tutankhamun all the time. So the reason I wrote this book is to show people how much new we've learned about Tutankhamun, what research looks like when you're doing research on, on a dead pharaoh, and things like that. So I want people to see that there's high-tech stuff going on about Tutankhamun all the time, and our view of him is changing quite a bit. Wow. So you're working on, are you working on like the mummy itself as well in this book, or do you just talk about some of the artifacts or what kind of... The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, doing, we're doing all of that, Kelly. Um, I, I, my specialty is mummies. Um, I'm, I'm a specialist with mummies. You know, most Egyptologists have specialists. Some guys are the translators, other guys are excavators, and mine is mummies. You know, so when, when a, uh, an interesting mummy is found on an excavation, sometimes I'm called in to work on the mummies. Um, one of my interesting things about, about Tut, the interest started when I examined the fetuses of Tutankhamun. You know, there were two fetuses, little mummified fetuses found in Tutankhamun's tomb. His wife, he was a teenager when he died. He dies at the age of 19, and his wife is about 19 when he dies also. They're both teenagers. But his wife, Anka Sanaman, had two miscarriages, two little girls, and they were mummified, and they were in the tomb. And, and they disappeared for years. They were put in storage, um, and it took me a couple of years to find them, but I found them. So I examined the fetuses. I talk a little bit about that. But more, I talk about the mummy of Tutankhamun himself, um, because some things that were said about the mummy, there's been a lot of research done, um, things about the mummy, I think, are wrong. And I, and I wanted to correct the record. I wanted to say, for, for example, um, it's generally accepted now, I think, I think, that Tutankhamun had a club foot. In uh, the 19, in, about 10 years ago, Tutankhamun was CAT scanned. And many of the researchers thought that the CAT scan showed that he had a club foot and then suggested that he walked on the side of his foot. So he would have been a disabled pharaoh. Um, and, and, and that's generally been accepted. But when I started going back and looking at the records, looking at the CAT scans and everything, it looks like he wasn't a disabled pharaoh. He didn't have a club foot. Um, and I'm not alone in thinking that, but I'm alone in saying it right now. Um, even, even for example, you know, one thing that started me wondering was Tutankhamun, if he had a club foot, he had been examined by two anatomists. The mummy had been examined by two anatomists before the, the CAT scans. Um, and they never noticed anything unusual about his ankle, for example. Or, uh, so it, it, it puzzled me. And then when I looked at the CAT scan, it wasn't clear that he had a club foot. Then I thought, what about his feet? That is, the lower limbs would be disfigured also, because if you walk on the side of your foot, it's going to affect the lower bones of your legs, the tibia and fibula. And, and they're normal. They're perfectly normal. Even the pelvis would be changed. You know how it is if you, if you have a little limp even. The pelvis is going to be affected, you know, and that's why people have to have hip replacements. Um, and he didn't have any of that. And, and further, when I started looking at his shoes, there were about two dozen shoes buried with him in the tomb. His shoes, yeah, yeah, well, he had to take it to the next world, right? He had his sandals, he had gold sandals, he had, um, but, but his shoes are perfectly symmetrical too. And if you walked on the side of your foot, dragging it, certainly the shoes would be worn out. So all of the evidence really changed it completely when I looked at the mummy, and it, and it now seems to me as if he was a perfectly healthy teenager. That's... Incredible. So you're sort of 
restarting the story of Tutankhamun from what we yeah, thought yeah, we knew. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, Kelly, it has a deeper um, effect also because everybody felt, well, since he's a fragile pharaoh, um, he certainly couldn't have gone off to war. But then that changes that. And as a matter of fact, recently there have been some blocks discovered from Tutankhamun's mortuary temple where he was worshipped after he died, and they show him a battle at war. So I think he may have actually gone into war. And for example, another bit of research on Tutankhamun is there was a, a suit of armor was buried with him. And people don't know that. It, it, was, it was in terrible condition. It was leather. It's like um, leather scales that are, that are cut out and they're all sewn together to form like an armor. And it was in terrible condition. It had de degraded a bit. Leather degrades over the thousands of years. And nobody wanted to work on it, touch it. But recently, some experts have been working on it and restoring it. And it looks like it, not only did he have a suit of armor, but it had been worn. It shows signs of wear. So I think I have a chapter in the book on Tutankhamun as a warrior, that he may have been a warrior. And that's changing things. So these are the kinds of things that I do in the book. Yeah, that's incredible. Because, I mean, if you spend, you know, we all think one thing about him and you've, you know, looked at shoes, you've looked at bones, and now suddenly it's a completely new narrative. Yeah. Do yeah. we... Do we know, I don't know a whole lot about Tutankhamun. In, sure. Do we know how he died and whether has that changed with your research? No, no we don't know. Uh, we really don't know how he died. Um, there's no obvious cause of death. Um, for example, I, I wrote a book about, oh, it must be 20 years ago now, called The Murder of Tutankhamun, which was based on x-rays of Tutankhamun's skull, which showed what looked like a blow to the back of the head. And I, I thought this might be, and evidence of murder. Now, why do I jump to say murder? You know, you could have fallen off a chariot you know, or anything. But w when, when he died, his widow, Anka Sanaman, the teenage queen, writes the strangest letter in Egyptian history. She writes to the enemy king, to the Hittite king, Shupilui Luma, great name, Shupilui Luma, um, writes to him and, says, and she says, and we have the letter, you know, we have records. She says, my husband has died. I have no sons. They say you have many. Send me one of your sons and I will marry him and make him king of Egypt. Never will I marry a servant of mine, I'm afraid. And what was the queen afraid of? You know, and, but she disappears from history. So it really sounded like he was murdered. There were enemies lurking around. Um, but, but the CAT scan showed, to be fair, that there was no blow to the back of the head. The x-ray was not accurate enough. The CAT scan, so we don't know how he died. So I can't say, nope, I can't jump up and down and say murder, murder, murder. Um, but he dies at the age of 19. It could have been an infection. Um, we, we think he had malaria from blood tests, we can tell. So, so he could have even died from malaria. Um, so we just don't know how Tutankhamun dies at the age of 19. Wow, such a mystery, especially knowing so much about him and having so much of his personal effects and stuff, not even know, not knowing how he dies is like a, such an important part of his story. It's almost annoying that we don't know that. Um, <laughs> so you've said you've worked on lots of mummies, that's your specialty. Why did you decide to write this book about Tutankhamun and the things found in his in his tomb. Sure. Well, this is the hundredth anniversary of the discovery of the tomb, so there's been a lot of interest in Tutankhamun. But also, along with that, there's a new museum being built in Cairo called the Grand Egyptian Museum, and all of Tutankhamun's objects are being moved from the old museum in Cairo out to Giza to the new museum. So while they're coming out of the cases. There's been all this new research, we've been able to get our hands on objects, actually see them, touch them, you know, take photograph them. So there's so much more information now because of this 100th anniversary and the Grand Museum that, you know, there's just so much stuff coming out that I thought it'd be interesting to tell people about it. Did you go into this book with the idea that you would be writing something brand new? Or did you think that it would just be like an updated version of things that we already knew? No, I thought I have new information. I knew that there were these new researchers and I had done a little bit of research. So no, I thought there'd be new things. Actually, there were more new things than I thought, um, you know, finding out things that, that I, that when I started putting pieces together, I was surprised. For, for example, um, one of the things that we knew about Howard Carter is that he took things from the tomb and didn't return them. Um, shame on him, but um, he wasn't interested in selling them. It wasn't for profit or anything like that, but he sort of had this feeling almost that he owned the tomb. Um, remember, this is 1922 when it's discovered, and England is ruling Egypt. It's a colonial situation. So in a sense, he is in charge. So, so he's taking things and he's giving them to friends as souvenirs of the tomb. So I started researching that, and we knew that. We knew that. And I found letters that, that Egyptologists has written about Carter taking, taking things, and they were kind of shocking, uh, really surprising, the, the, the extent to which Carter took things and the sort of um, 
feeling of entitlement almost. And, I mean, for example, the, the seals to the tomb, the, 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 the walls were sealed with the necropolis seal of the, of the nine jackals, and, and it's pretty impressive seals. And he gave them away. He gave them to Sir Alan Gardner, who was an Egyptologist, and Gardner gave them to his kids. So this is what's happening. To this. Yeah, yeah. So there's more, much more. And even, even there, were, there were necklaces that, that disappeared and, and appeared in museums around the world. Uh, so I discovered that he was really doing more, more pilfering than we thought. You know, we knew that it happened, but this was more than I thought. So I discovered quite a few things that, that I didn't know. Uh, so was, that's half the fun of doing a book. You know, you, you do the research and then you make discoveries and, and it's exciting. I hope yeah, it definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that just makes me think of um, Heinrich Schliemann with, you know, the Priam's treasure. You know, he had his wife wear the incredible necklace and, and headdress. And you're thinking, how is that? How, you know, us, us now in, you know, the modern day, we would never dream of doing anything, even, you know, putting it on a person, let alone taking it and giving it to someone else's kids. Right, it's you just, are. Right, you are. I mean, no, no. I and mean, we'd all be wearing white gloves and making sure we don't contaminate the objects. Or no, these were different times. They were really, really, really different times. Blows my mind. It really does. Yeah. Um, so, would you say that was the most surprising thing when you were researching and working on the book, or was there something else that really fascinated or surprised surprised yeah. you whilst working on it? Well, I'll tell you the truth, there were quite a few things that surprised me. One thing, one chapter I really loved that was a lot of fun doing. I think is called "It Came from Outer Space." Now. I don't know if you guys have this in the UK, but we have this dreadful show called Ancient Aliens. Um, it's a show, it's a series, it's a TV show, which talks about how the ancient aliens came to Earth years ago and, and, and stuff like that. It's, it's dreadful. Um, and, and so I, I decided I had to call my, my chapter, it came from outer space, but I think a lot of people are gonna be disappointed. It doesn't deal with ancient aliens. There, there are no spacecrafts discussed. Um, but some of the objects in Tutankhamun's tomb did in fact come from outer space. Now you're wondering, I can see a little puzzled look on your face. Um, there was no iron in Egypt. Egypt did not have iron. It had copper and it had tin and it could make bronze, which is a combination of copper and tin, but it didn't have iron, right? In Tutankhamun's time. But there were five or six iron objects found in Tutankhamun's tomb. Now, where did they come from? They're meteoritic. They were made out of meteorites. So meteorites, landed or came and then somebody pounded out these objects from them and some are quite beautiful there's a beautiful dagger an iron dagger that was two times was buried with with a rock crystal handle and it's just beautiful and it's made out of meteoritic iron um and he had other ob ob objects too and i think these were very very magical objects because they were so precious because they didn't have iron so he was buried with six or so meteoritic iron so that, that's kind of interesting also see for example one doesn't make any sense at all to me he had a set of chisels now when I say chisels, I mean like workman's chisels. They're wooden handles with metal bits made out of meteoritic iron. And they're not particularly fancy. They're not worthy of a king. They almost look like they were workmen's that forgot them behind in the tomb or something. But they were there in the tomb. So it's kind of curious. Most of the objects are, are precious. I mean, there's a little amulet of an eye. There's a, there's a, there's a you know, comes a beautiful pectoral thing. But, but this, this chisel set puzzles me. I don't know why he had it. He wouldn't have used it in real life. I'm sure he didn't do his own chiseling. You know, he had people do it for him. But so there were lots of things discovered, you know, in the tomb that are, that are kind of interesting that I, I found, I've, you know, all kinds of fun things discovered. Amazing. And would it be plausible to think that that chisel set was left behind by someone? Because I know that he died, you know, unexpectedly because he was so young and it, the tomb was sort of put together quickly. And I'm pretty sure parts of it were, re, you know, something was reused from an earlier thing or from someone else's. Um, is that plausible that maybe a builder did just leave it in there? I think so. I think so. I think that there was a, there must have been a, a rush to bury him. You know, you, you, he's mummified. They, they didn't get him in the tomb. And, and all the craftsmen in the country almost were working on these things for Tutankhamun's tomb. You have to pray. They only had 70 days because the Pharaoh has to be buried in 70 days. That was a religious ritual. So they've got to get all these things, all these treasures. So they're even borrowing things from other tombs. They're taking things from out of other tombs, royal tombs, putting them in there, things like that. Um, and they're repurposing things. So, for example, his sarcophagus that he's buried in, the, 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 the rectangular box, you know, that's, that, was, that was redone from somebody else's. And even the lid, the lid is made of a different stone. So the, the, the lid cracked. They tried to fix it. They had to do another lid. So there's, there's all kinds of indications of haste. And I think these chips may have been just left behind by the workmen. You know, let's get out of here, boys. We're done. And you've got his, you've got his set of chisels. Wow. Yeah, That's yeah. incredible. 
Is there, especially because they're moving all of the things from one museum to the other, have there, have there been things that have turned up that you didn't even know were found a hundred years ago? Were there things that weren't documented that have? Everything, Everything was documented fairly carefully. Harmon Carter, when he did the excavation, set new standards for excavators. He's the first one, I believe, who photographs everything in situ, in the tomb before it's moved, so that we have a complete record of what did it look like when he discovered it. So every object has a little number on it. They have a little card. They put a number in front of it. They photograph everything. So we know everything that was in the tomb pretty, pretty well, pretty well. So no big, big surprise of, oh, we didn't know about that. But what did happen over the course of the years, not everything was put on ex exhibition in the Cairo Museum. Some were put in the storeroom, for example, the chisels. Nobody was interested in the chisel, but they were in a storeroom. So a lot of things went, went missing temporarily. They were in storerooms, they were put away. So when everything is going over to the Grand Museum, this new Grand Egyptian Museum, there are things that were discovered. Like, for example, I had never known about the armor, the suit of armor that he was buried with. So that wasn't on display because it's in poor condition. Or, for example, one thing that's been examined now, he had something like 30, 40 pairs of shoes that he, that he went to the next world with. And they're really quite interesting. And so a separate study has been made of the shoes. And, and they're so neat. I mean, you'd love it. Um, he had sandals, lots of sandals. Now, he was buried with sandals on his feet. They were gold, solid gold. Now, they're not usable. They're not practical. Gold is very soft. Also, um, These were his sandals for eternity. Gold never tarnishes. So for the next world, you want things in gold. So he was buried with gold sandals, right? But he had other sandals that had mosaics on the bottom, on, on the top of the bottom, if you know what I mean, where his foot would touch. And the mosaic was of captives, his enemies. So every place he would walk, he would step on his enemy. You know, so, kind of, so you have these bound Assyrians, bound Nubians, bound Libyans. They chose them all in their native garb, and Tutankhamun would walk on them wherever he goes. You know, so he had loads of these sandals and shoes and everything like that. And it's kind of interesting to see even how they made sandals, you know, by, by because we're moving these sandals now for the first time to the museum, people can get their hands on who knows about this thing. So, for example, there were reed sandals made of reeds that are bundled together, tied together, and they're still beautiful, elegant, um, but they're just made so minutely. Uh, so the loads of things we learn about from this by handling, by, by getting them out of the cases, by finding things in storerooms. I mean, it's just remarkable what we're finding about Todd. Incredible. I'm so excited to read your book. And it's got new, it's got new things, and, and I do go against um, some of the traditional theories about Tut and things like that. I and mean, one of the things I talk about also, which, which is, I think, kind of interesting, is there was this theory that, now Tutankhamun's tomb is very small, just a couple of rooms, because they didn't have a long time to build it over 20, 30 years. So it's very modest in terms of size. And one of the theories is that his mother was buried behind the wall. She dies first, is buried behind the wall, and that's plastered over. Um, and, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about this. Um, because when, when, the, when the room, Tutankhamun's paintings were very carefully studied recently with laser technology so that we can get a really careful, um, how to say it, topography of the wall. We know the bumps in the wall. We know everything about the wall. Now, one of the things that's, dis that's discovered when they did this about the wall, right, is that there's a part of, of the wall that's been repainted in modern times, in modern times, meaning 1920s. 1930s. Now, how did that happen, right? Now, the answer is, the answer is, I think, I think it's a straightforward answer, but maybe not. Howard Carter was an artist. He started his career as a 17-year-old artist on an excavation in Egypt, and he, and he was very good at it, but he was also very bright, and they realized he had even more talent than art, and he became an excavator, and he eventually became a chief inspector for the Egyptian Antiquity Service, so he really had lots of skills, but he had this basics in art, right? He was an artist. So what I think happens is the following. There is a scene on the wall of Tutankhamun wearing a kilt. And this kilt, it was photographed in 1922. It has a certain number of pleats. It's a pleated kilt and it has a number of pleats, stripes on the kilt, 1922. If you look at it today, it's got a different number of pleats, completely different completely different. And what happened, what, really, and what happened, I think, now how does it happen, right? What, what's going on? I th yeah, I think, I think, not, this, is, this is my suggestion. 
I think when Carter was moving things in and out of the tomb, he damaged the painting. And then later, he painted over it. And it's got this, not only did he paint over it, though, this is kind of cool. On the walls of the tomb is mold, ancient mold, 3,000-year-old mold. When they buried Tutankhamun, they didn't have time to leave the tomb open so the paint could dry. So it was still, while it still had moisture in it, and mold could grow on it. So the mold grew on it for maybe a couple of years and then dies. So the, there are mold spots all over the tomb. When Howard Carter repainted the kilt, he painted fake mold on it so that it wouldn't look, look new. So nobody knew about this for like 70 years till a scholar got to look close up at it and he noticed, hey, there's a different number of stripes on the kilt. So there's this- That's awesome. Yeah, there's all kinds of fun discoveries. So th this is the kind of thing that I like discovering, yeah. Oh yeah, that is so much fun. I yeah. think my last question is, what is something that you think everybody should know about the topic of your book? Hmm. I think it's the basic thing. I think it's that there's loads of new research on Tutankhamun. It's evolving and he may not be the boy king who is fragile, never went into war or any of that. All this research is helping us paint a much better picture of Tutankhamun. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Bob. Now, Bob's book will be available to purchase from Oxford University Press on October 27th, and you'll be able to find a link for it down below. Thank you so much for joining me today. It has been a pleasure talking to you. It's been a lot of fun for me, Kelly. Take care. Bye-bye. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organisation and you can find us on Patreon, a brilliant site where you can support our work and receive exclusive benefits in return. Your support helps us create videos twice a week. So make sure to check it out via the pop-up in the top corner of the screen or via the Patreon link down below. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you soon with another video.